Well, I'm glad you're back, and I am. Unfortunately, Carolyn Glick is not with us due to some technical difficulties, but I'm thrilled to say that we have with her absence uh, the presence of a good friend and colleague, both of Carolyn's and of mine, at the Center for Security Policy, one of our senior fellows and a man who directs our Middle East programs. His name is Dr. David Wormser. He's a man of extraordinary experience, uh, having served in the United States Navy Reserves as an intelligence officer, having also served, among other things, as an assistant to then Vice President Dick Cheney, specifically helping on his Middle East portfolio responsibilities. He is uh, a great asset, and we're delighted to have him in Carolyn's stead because he is very deeply steeped, as well as she is, on what's going on with respect to Iran at the moment, and specifically what the Biden administration is doing that is, well, rewarding intransigence on the part of the mullahs, likely to precipitate more of it, and probably a lot worse besides. David Wormser, thank you so much for joining us on short notice at Securing America. Great to have you with us, sir. Yeah, it's great to be here, Frank. Uh, wonderful to be on. It's great. Let me start by just asking you to quickly summarize, David, um, the state of play as best we can understand it. Uh, in Vienna, I guess, where these uh, negotiations with the Iranians are taking place with other parties, but sort of more generally in the uh, bilateral sphere with the United States government under Joe Biden and his team, and uh, as I say, the Ayatollah and his. Well, specifically in Vienna, it's a little bit murky precisely because the chief negotiator, Bob Malley, is keeping it murky from what we hear, perhaps even a little bit murky from his own bosses. It wouldn't be the first time I remember uh, when I was in the State Department back uh, 2003, 2002, uh, the negotiating team for North Korea uh, kept things, uh, and Colin Powell kept things from the president and the national security advisor because they were quite afraid of what the reaction might be if they had really heard what was going on on the ground. We may be in a similar situation, but that said, one has to assume that Bob Malley speaks for the administration. So where, what do we know so far? We know that three of the most uh, seasoned negotiators, probably way too concession conciliatory for my taste, uh, resigned uh, or were shoved out because they were holding back a deal, meaning that the deal is most likely emerging, is most likely much softer than what those negotiators would have had, which is quite surprising. Number yeah, two, that's saying something, we, isn't it? Uh, that's saying a lot and not good. Uh, the second thing is that we are seeing sanctions beginning to be lifted. We see allies lifting sanctions like South Korea, and we ourselves are talking about lifting sanctions. Uh, and moreover, we're negotiating deals with uh, Egypt and, and Syria for oil and gas that uh, could also funnel money to Syria, which is in essence at this point giving money to Hezbollah and uh, Iran. So we see the, the pressure being preemptively lifted on the Iranians. Clearly, the Iranians aren't fully agreeing to the terms of the deal yet. So we're trying to sweeten it. Now, the deal that we hear about is uh, it's not the deal of five years ago, six years ago. It's called the JCPOA. It is, uh, it is clearly less strict than that. Um, so we're, we're dealing now with, a, with basically a diplomatic freefall. And the Israelis have already expressed their frustration and said that a, a no deal would be much better than any deal that's emerging. Clearly, the Arab uh, countries surrounding Iran uh, are also saying and signaling the same thing. So we have a situation where I think the United States is headed for a deal at almost any cost. And the consequence of Let me ask you, though, David. Yeah, to, to the consequences of this. Uh, is there any foreseeable prospect, especially if we're doing it on basically Iran's terms, that it will impede, uh, to say nothing of stop, their nuclear weapons programs and ambitions? No, it won't, because they've 
you know, it, the Iranians have tended to concede things that they anyway were going to concede or didn't need at the moment. So in previous agreements, when they gave up uh, enrichment, it was because they didn't really need that uranium at that moment. They were in a pause anyway while they were installing new centrifuges, which then could very rapidly uh, compensate for any uranium they gave up. So it, it was a great gesture that we bought hook, line, and sinker. But in the end, it made almost no difference in terms of really delaying the program. The core concession we gave them was what really mattered, which was to allow them to work, install, and upgrade their centrifuges so that they could take a year's worth of uranium production and make it, make it in a few weeks. So that's an example of how these deals are really not doing what they're purported to do. We are hearing the so administration... Let me just... Sorry. Let me just ask you, we've been hearing about the Iranians being a year from the bomb, um, a couple of months from the bomb, uh, now weeks from the bomb. I think about two months ago, uh, maybe a little bit more, it was 10 weeks away from the bomb. At some point, they get it. Um, do you have any confidence that we're still shy of that mark, David Wormser, or is it entirely possible that they do, in fact, have at least some nuclear capability and will have more uh, as they buy more time and get, well, money from South Korea and, and other concessions from us? Well, it hasn't been described this way, but I, I essentially think we're in a breakout mode now. Uh, the Iranians might not have a device yet because they... Uh, lack a sufficient amount of uranium, or maybe they have a strategy of coming up with enough uranium for four or five bombs before they cross the line with their first. Uh, and they they haven't tested it, although I wouldn't too much stock in that because they're cooperating with the North Koreans, which have been. Yes. So I, I would assume that they have warhead designs they've been working on secretly. I would assume that the, they've had uh, similar technologies to the North Koreans and such that they know that it will work. I think the despair that you're hearing of these uh, estimates is in part the administration trying to lay down the, the uh, public relations case for a deal. They're basically saying, hey, right. without a deal, we're weeks, weeks with, from a nuclear bomb. And this is Trump's fault because he will have walked out of the deal. So we need to come to a terms of whatever the deal is. If it, if it delays it three months, that's three months better than where we are. So they're, they're beginning to lay out desperate case the israelis are basically saying from what we hear we don't know what their estimate is without a deal. their estimate with the deal that they hear is emerging and i would assume the israelis know what are in the terms of this deal probably not told by the united states but they have their own ways of knowing uh is right. that the deal would only delay things by four to six months so uh it, it, the deal is basically worthless i would be very yeah. careful of this despair the administration is projecting because they're trying to make the case. And, and I think it's an important point worth bearing here. No deal does not mean Iran is free and clear. And this is something that, that wasn't adequately emphasized during the Trump administration. This deal was a cutout specifically tailored to the Iranians for their cheating. They cheated on their obligations under the MPP. Because we gave up on trying to bring them back into their obligations, we essentially gave them a special uh, cutout deal. If they are not Just in that deal... One that of many concessions, a, obviously. Right. If they're not in that deal, they are under the obligations of the MPT, which are much stricter the than the The non treaty. Yeah. 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 In theory, uh, they are exactly. if anybody would enforce it. David, we're, we're almost out of time. I, I did just want to ask you quickly about Israel, and is it likely to feel that it really has no choice at this point but to go it alone in trying to actually prevent the realization of these nuclear weapons ambitions that clearly are an existential threat to the Jewish state? I think it's dawning on the Israelis they will have to go alone. They're laying down markers diplomatically. They're saying publicly they will not be held by a deal. They won't be deterred by a deal. They will do what they have to do. Um, so, so verbally. Now, this uh, we've lost your David. This sets the stage, of course, for uh, at a minimum a regional conflict, perhaps of a nuclear character. One we've 
unlike anything we've ever seen before. Uh, and the danger, you know, that flows from that is it comes at a moment when, uh, David, are you back with us? Can you hear me? And can I hear you? I, I hear you perfectly. Yes. I don't know. Good. You can hear me. Great. It comes at a moment when there is so much else going on, as we've been talking about in the course of the program and will with Sam Faddis, that really makes this a fraught time. Uh, just very quickly, and I've got less than a minute. If Carolyn were with us, I think she would have said, we've created conditions in which it's better to be America's enemy than our friend. Is that your view as well, David? And what are the implications? Quickly. Yes, yeah, sadly, it's it's quite true. I mean, the Iranians are sitting confident and they believe they're on a rampage that is unanswered. Uh, they have regional countries that are definitely uh, their enemy, like Israel and UAE, Saudi Arabia. But uh, the United States is not there. The United States is not there. And I think it's symbolized by the fact that we allowed the Nord Stream pipeline to go to Russia, but we've now opposed an Israeli natural gas pipeline to Europe and our own pipeline to yeah. South. So, and I we're taking is- defensive weapons away from some of those allies that you've mentioned at the moment that they're being attacked by the Houthis, uh, the proxies for the Iranians. So much more to talk with you about. Uh, we simply can't do it today, David. I do want to thank you for filling in so handsomely for Carolyn on short notice as well as for the great work you do at the Center for Security Policy and have been doing in our government and in other capacities ever since I first met you, which was decades ago now. God bless you, my friend. Come back to us again soon, if you would. Next up, we're going to continue on our assessment of the things we need to be protected against with the great Sam Fattis, notably in Afghanistan and here. Right at- 